Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hey, thanks for the response. That's great. <laughs> Usually I'm off to a flying stop, so it's great. Thanks for being here this evening for this third installment of our three-part series on faith, hope, and love. And this evening we'll be talking about Medjugorje. I'll be sharing with you some stories, some anecdotes, some personal experiences, some information from various different sources about the ongoing apparitions and about the Vatican's position on Medjugorje. It is still, I might say, before we start, not an approved apparition site at this point in time. But it is a very holy place for those of you that have been, for those of you that may yet have the opportunity to go. I'm Deacon Mike with St. Mary's Parish out in Sycamore, and it is an absolute delight and privilege to be able to be here Deacon Willie was so kind to uh, allow me to be part of this series. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask your, uh, your uh, prayers as we go through this also, that uh, the good Lord shines on us and Satan doesn't put any glitches in the computer or anything like that. Uh, it's been an interesting week at home, I'll tell you. I used a lot of holy water on my computer. So. <laughs> Anyway, we will begin. We'll be, this, we'll be talking tonight about love and Medjugorje and uh, the love that permeates Medjugorje, the love that comes from within and just being there or just knowing that Medjugorje exists and taking nourishment from the messages, the so many messages that we've gotten over the decades now. And let's say I have to go this way. There we go. The apparitions at Medjugorje have been going on now for about 35 plus years. We just had the anniversary. Uh, back in June. Um, they started on June 24th, 1981. And does anybody know who the saint was on June 24th in our, pardon me? St. John, John the Baptist. Thank you. Boy, you are up on your Catholicism, I'll tell you. <laughs> I almost had to guess. <laughs> anyway, it's a beautiful, it was a beautiful start, if you will, for this ongoing uh, apparition that continued in Medjugorje. The um, first question that usually comes up when we talk about Medjugorje, if you've not had the opportunity to look at this, is where in the world is Medjugorje? And about the easiest way to explain it is that it's actually off the map over here. Uh, if, you, if you assume that this is the uh, east side of Italy, and if you assume that right about here is where Rome is, if you were to go across the Adriatic, you'd come to the Dalmatian coast, and if you continued on straight in that direction, you'd come to Medjugorje. Medjugorje is about two-thirds of the distance for a split that, that Dubrovnik would be down just a little bit further. But it's a small, basically, little town that happened to get very big for very big and important reasons. This is a, a quick look at the three important things that I'm going to be talking about tonight, and that is where the church is located in reference to what we would call Cross Mountain, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit for those of you who might not be familiar with that, and Apparition Hill, Mount Prabrado, which is roughly this point up here. The picture is from 1980 before anything had actually happened in Medjugorje. But basically we'll be talking about those three locations through the uh, talk tonight. Medjugorje basically is a, was a village back before it became a, a town. And uh, it was noted primarily in the earlier days uh, before 1981 for tobacco and for grapes for wine. It was uh, considered very good soil for, for both of those products. The people were hard working and they were essentially Catholic. And uh, in 1933, actually probably the latter part of 1932, the village fathers got together and made a decision that they wanted to do something special for 1933 because 1933 represented the 1900 years since Jesus Christ had died on the cross. And so they elected to come up with the idea of building a cross on Mount Krishavek, which is a mountain that's approximately twice the height of Apparition Hill, which is about 800 or 900 feet. And so they actually went about uh, bringing up all of the materials. Uh, there, were, there was no, no railway, there was no path, essentially, what you had to follow in those years, which you still have to follow today, is a dry riverbed most of the time, except when it rains. And when it rains, the water has to get down somehow, and it usually finds the path of least resistance. And that's what's carved out the two ways for the water to come down off of the mountain. 
So the, the, mount, the path for the mountain actually is the dry riverbed, if you will. And everything is as you would expect in a dry riverbed, sharp rocks, unstable rocks, um, lots of little potholes and things of that nature to possibly twist your ankle in and so on and so forth. But they brought everything up. All of the cement had to be brought up by hand. They had porters to bring up some of the equipment, uh, some of the big um, uh, mixing um, barrels that they would have to use for making the concrete to be able to erect the statue. But they did finish in 1933. Uh, anybody want to guess how high the statue is? 33. <laughs> 33 feet. Another Catholic coincidence, as we say. And there is in that cross a portion of the cross of Christ that is embedded in that concrete. The, the Vatican was very uh, very appreciative of the effort, and they sent a piece of the wood of the cross actually to be part of that. In the 1950s, uh, the church, the original church of Medjugorje, actually burned down. And um, the problem with the, uh, the, the church was that the composition of that whole area, it's all old volcanic rock, and it's, it's extremely hard rock. The, the bases and the valleys and so forth are slate. And the slate has a tendency in that area because of earthquakes and other things to move quite a bit. So the church actually started shifting on its foundations and apparently at one point in time a gas line severed and the church basically burned down. And so the priests got together uh, along with the bishop to decide what to do to be able to replace it. And they decided on a replacement for the church. The replacement actually um, was twice the size of the existing church. And the people in the small little town were absolutely outraged that so much would be spent on something so large that so few people would be able to use. Never knowing that in Mary's plan that one day that church would not be able to hold all of the people who came to see it uh, and that the cross would become a center of attention where wonderful and wondrous things happen and also something that tied us back to the roots of our faith, if you will. What affected the whole area was the breakup of Yugoslavia. So if you remember the, the, those times, uh, Marshal Tito, I think, was the ruler of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia came to pass as a result of the end of the Second World War, where Stalin wanted to make sure that he had control in various areas and he would rather have a whole bunch of little countries in the Baltic states all be under one umbrella, which is Yugoslavia, rather than their own individual countries. So he pulled all of the countries together, and then Marshal Tito died. And when he died, there was a move to basically separate into the individual companies that they had been before. And of course, all of the old prejudices and all of the old arguments and everything else all went into causing there to be frictions among the countries, and then before you know it, war. And uh, if you remember, you remember Sarajevo, where they had the Olympics? What, a, what a, a horror that turned out to be. It was a place of death. It was tragic, the killings that went on there. Um, it, was, it was genocide on an increasingly bad, bad scale. Well, eventually they got past those things, and eventually the countries came together with their agreements and so forth and respected each other's territories. Ivan, the visionary, um, had come out to the United States actually uh, 19, what would it have been, 1988 or 1989, I think it was. And he did a series of talks in the area here. I don't know if any of you had been to one of his talks. He came out to St. Peter's uh, and talked there on his, his life, uh, how it has changed you know, with the apparitions being now part of his regular life. And he talked about um, that, uh, it was an interesting, it was a funny story, that he was the, one, of the, uh, one of the first visionaries to actually see Mother Mary. And after the vision had been shown to him, he basically ran home and he ran through the house, ran to his bedroom, ran inside, closed the door, pulled the cover back on the bed and covered himself with a blanket. He was so afraid of what he had just witnessed and not understanding basically what it was. But he came out to St. Peter's and he was talking about uh, uh, his, his, uh, his life there and how it had changed forever and how humbled he was to be able to be a recipient of the, of the messages from Mary. 
And uh, I told him, well, you know, at that time, uh, my, uh, my wife Carol had been suffering with cancer for uh, well, probably about a good 15 years at that point. And uh, he said, well, he says, uh, you know, you, you, you know, Medjugorje is such a special place. And I said, well, we'd like to go, but we just don't seem to be able to make it happen. And he stopped what he was doing, and he turned around and he looked at me, and he said, you must come to Medjugorje. And I said, well, all right. <laughs> I had doctor bills like you wouldn't believe. Um, Carol was very fragile because of the chemos and so forth. We didn't know how it was going to work, but we had, a, we had an invite from Yvonne. And it wasn't that long afterwards that, uh, because of the money problems and so forth, that unbeknownst to us, Carol's brother-in-law, Frank, and her sister, Jean, sent us a check for the exact amount to be able to get to Medjugorje. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What an incredible, incredible gift it was. And Carol did go, and she did climb the hill, and she did see signs and wonders, and it was just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful opportunity for the two of us to be in Mary's land. These little uh, quotations that you'll find sometimes at the top there are basically from Mary, and the date would be the date that Mary said it to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, the, the young children. The world must find salvation while there is still time. Let us pray with fervor. May it have the spirit of faith. You know, you look at the world today. I don't recognize it. You know, I, I grew up in the 40s. You know, I was, well, I didn't grow up in the 40s. I was a little kid in the 40s. But the 1950s were pretty much my, the beginnings of my growth and everything. And uh, went through the 1960s and so forth. And what a different world it was for those of us who went through those times. Uh, there was peace. There was harmony for the most part. There were still all of the little things that make a society kind of tense sometimes. But it was a wonderful time to grow up. And I look at the world today and I say, what do our poor children have to go through? with what's going on throughout the world. It's a world on fire, an absolute world on fire. And so Medjugorje, Medjugorje is offered as the antidote, or one of the antidotes, if you will, for that world on fire, through prayer and through other means. Uh, I had a chance to uh, talk to Mary Ann O'Reilly, who uh, had been running tours out to Medjugorje since the early 1980s, uh, when the, uh, the war had begun. And it was not unusual in those days that when tour groups went out, they packed up their suitcases with food and medicine and bandages and uh, anything else, toilet paper, you know, just some simple, simple things, and would bring that in. I don't want to say smuggle because that's a dirty word, but <laughs> it would get into the country and it would be distributed to the people who were so in desperate need at that point in time. Marianne can't remember how many times she's been to Medjugorje. She won't share a number with me, so but it's been a huge number of times. I had a chance to go on pilgrimage with her group. And uh, Father Parker was actually uh, our uh, spiritual director for that troop. Uh, Father Parker's over at Holy Cross, as you probably know. And Father Parker uh, actually got his calling for Medjugorje out at Medjugorje. Or his calling for the priesthood, excuse me, out at Medjugorje. So very, very powerful uh, experience for him. So Father Parker was our guide, if you will, for the entire time, our spiritual director. A couple things on the Vatican which is important to say before we get into this too much more deeply. The Vatican is the final authority on the things that are going on in Medjugorje and we submit to the will of the Vatican as far as what their findings may eventually be. The, the findings will be reviewed at the point where the apparitions actually stop and the ten secrets are given to the children, the six children now, six adults of course. Uh, but we submit to the Vatican authority. The, uh, Vatican is the final adjudicator as to the validity of the apparitions, that they in fact are true and real and did happen. The church cannot attest to the events there until all of the apparitions have ceased. They have, that has to cease before the church can begin to take any steps. Obedience to the church is absolutely necessary. We have to obey the findings of the church as they find for Medjugorje or against Medjugorje in the future. And the church moves at its own pace and will rule in its own time. We, we are slow, but we continue to go forward. <laughs> and that's okay, too. That's okay, too. And then I thought this was kind of interesting. I came across this in one of the apparition uh, uh, messages. It said, and this is from Mother Mary, so she's kind of weighing in on this whole topic also. In 1984, she said, 
It is intentional that all apparitions are under the auspices of the Catholic Church. So there you have it. She's telling us how we need to be, not to be judgmental, not to be anything other than just open to whatever it is that Mother Church will tell us as they go through the examination of all of the things from the start of the apparitions up until the time the apparitions have concluded. Uh, the Marian beginnings, if you will, for the apparitions began with Ivanka and Mariana, uh, two little children who happened to be walking along. And uh, Ivanka saw a flash of light about, well, it wasn't really quite halfway up the hill, maybe about a third of the way up the hill. It was like a bubble, a soap bubble, and within it appeared a lady in blue. And Ivanka thought Gaspa, that was her first thought. Gaspa in Croatian is Mary, and so, our, or Our Lady. So Mariana thought that it was a prank, and uh, Milka had joined them also, and they all saw the th same thing. Well, Vika ran away and returned with Ivan Ivankovic and Ivan Dregicevic. <laughs> Ivan Dregicevic ran home, and that was Ivan, and he was the one who covered himself, if you will, with the blankets, uh, frightened out of his wits when he saw what they had seen. What followed after that was that all of them felt a strong urge to return to the site of the vision, but Milka and Ivan Ivankovic didn't return. Uh, Milka had to basically do chores around the, uh, the gardens, and so she wasn't able to go back again. And Ivan Ivankovic just wasn't, uh, he didn't feel the pull and the tug that he wanted to be there anymore. And sadly, both of them have not had apparitions since their decision not to go. And then the conversations began. So many questions. And yes, she was Mary, the mother of God. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, Vika's mother had told her that you don't know what you're dealing with. This could be evil influences. So what I want you to do is I want you to sprinkle Mother Mary with holy water and say, are you really Mother Mary? And that's for the back. And she did, and Mary laughed and said, yes, she is Mary. <laughs> Our mother has a beautiful sense of humor. She came to, she'd come to tell them that God exists and he loves you. That's a message that we don't really hear all that often. We have so many things that are going on, if you will, in our lives that we tend to get deflected away and kind of lose sight of the fact that we're on this earth for one purpose, to know love and to serve God. And that sometimes gets pretty well lost in the translation if we're not careful. We need to be very careful. But yet suddenly on that moment when she said that was why she came to say that God exists and he loves you, life turned suddenly forever as far as Medjugorje was concerned. A summary of the timeline. Since 1981, Mother Mary has appeared to the children, now adults. Uh, for over 35 years, she has given messages uh, at her own choosing, at her own time, and at her own place. The messages don't necessarily have to be at Apparition Hill or at Mount Krishavec. Uh, in the early years when they were being chased by the communists and the police who wanted to put them in jail and basically end the silly nonsense of these children claiming to see Mary, uh, it wouldn't be uh, unusual to have an apparition at the side of the road. Or they'd be driving in a van of a police van or something like that and they'd tell the driver to pull over and they'd get out of the police van and go into the apparition uh, uh, moment. So the, secret, the secrets basically are 10 that will be given to each of the six children. And at that time, when all six of the children have the 10 secrets, the public visions will cease. They will be no more from that point on. Um, just a picture of the visionaries back in the early days. Um, Ivan, Maria, Ivanka, Mariana, Yakov, and Vika. And they had a question for the Blessed Mother. They said, why are you appearing to us? We are no better than the others. And Mother Mary responded, I do not always choose the best. Are you angry with me? <laughs> How sweet. Mother Mary does have a sense of humor. <laughs> and no, they weren't angry with her. They were just concerned because they didn't feel themselves worry. Mother Mary's warnings, spiritual warfare is real. It is going on every single second of the day in this world that we live in right now and we need to continue to be aware of that. Mary tells us to pray because Satan is trying to thwart her plans. How does she want us to be disposed fast one day? 
make a sacrifice. You know, have very simple things, soup, bread, water, things that basically you're willing to give up in order to be able to offer sacrifice back to Mary, for her to be able to use that gift, if you will, of sacrifice for good purposes. The other thing is Satan seeks a body count. He could care less about any one of us. He really doesn't care. He really is just looking to get the numbers. He really wants the numbers. And he's trying to impose his power on you. You must pray and fast in order to fight against that. Uh, when I was doing my presentation preparation and I uh, was making my copies of the, the uh, presentation, just so I had a copy of it, I was pretty close to the end of the uh, presentation and all of a sudden I hear from the copier, and nothing's coming out. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, good Lord, there's a page in there and it's stuck. So I'm kind of like watching it and it comes out maybe a little bit and then you hear it again. And finally the page comes out. And so I went over to get the page to see which page it was that got so messed up. And it was the page that says, spiritual warfare is real, Satan seeks a body count. <laughs> That's the only page that got stuck. Now, I, I laughed so much, I had to go back and take a look and see what number slide it was. You want to guess what the number was? 13, thank you. <laughs> Always good for a laugh. Always good for a laugh. It is a battle for souls. It's, it's a real battle. We are on the front line, all of us. Mary's instructions to us, pray fast, and penance and confession. Go frequently, go frequently to confession. Be in that good state. You know, we can say to ourselves, well, you know, I'm, I'm I, I, um, sorry I did something, but I'm okay now. But there's something about going to the priest and confessing your sins, just as probably the, uh, the apostles did, you know, to Peter. Peter may have been the first confessor, you know, and then the apostles were the confessors after that. It's the intermedi intermediary through all of that but it's also the direct line to God for the, for the power of God. And coming back down again, it's also the forgiveness of the sins so that we are washed clean again and uh, as, as we should be. So these are the three messages basically from Mary. Pray fast, penance, and confession. The fruits of the pilgrimage. Uh, near as we can tell, there's about 61 million people that have gone to Medjugorje as far as keeping numbers goes. 61 million people. Those of you that have been to Medjugorje, where do they put them? <laughs> That's a lot of people. I know they have youth group programs now where they'll bring youth groups over for youth day or something like that. And it's not unusual for those youth groups to be somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people. You know, it's incredible. Fortunately, there's a lot of farmland there. So a lot of places to put down campgrounds, if you will. There are also, uh, according to the numbers that we have, 600,000 con-celebrating priests that have celebrated Mass with the priest, the priest presider uh, for that entire time. And there have been over 20 million Eucharists that have been distributed through Holy Communion. And that's actually probably a low number because they didn't keep really good records in the early days. The fruits of the pilgrimage, it's incredible. Uh, countless confessions, conversions, souls touched, countless prayers for others throughout the world. Had a fellow that I happened to, uh, to see the, the, the year that Carol and I went out there. Uh, she and I had gone to uh, the church from uh, our, our pension, our, our little place where we stay when we're out there. It's like a little hotel. And uh, I was uh, at the back end of the church and I was looking at the crowd in front and for whatever the reason, there was a fellow that just happened to make eye contact with me. And I had no idea why it was the two of us making eye contact, but for some reason there was some sort of a connection and he happened to wander around a little bit and then he came back by me and we just happened to say hi to each other. His name was John. He was an airport, uh, airplane uh, pilot for one of the major airlines and uh, he unfortunately wound up uh, being uh, dismissed by the airlines because he had a drinking problem. He went through a whole number of different uh, jobs but he wasn't able to find his center. There was something missing so he thought he needed to go to Medjugorje. And so, Myself first and then Carol from time to time meeting with him. We probably bumped into him in our six days out there at least 20 times. On the path going to Apparition Hill, on the path going to, uh, uh, to Mount Krishavik, uh, in town, at dinner, 
just continually bumping into them and continuing to have that same conversation. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And the message to Carol and I was so sweet and simple. Surrender. But for whatever the reason, he didn't have the capacity to let go of whatever it was that was holding him back. And the last time I remember seeing him out there, he was getting ready to leave, and we happened to bump into him one last time. Carol and I were both there. She gave him the once over. You know, she, you know, the mama, little Italian mama, she really is getting into him, you know, why he has to change his ways and he has to be open to all of this. And I talked to him, and then he went his own way, and we never saw him again. I never heard anything from him again. But how interesting is it that sometimes God just puts people in your lives that you have no idea why, but nevertheless, there's fruits if you allow it to happen. They've also had, in this time of 35 years, 12,775 sunrises and 12,775 sunsets. So how do we approach Medjugorje? Well, Carol and I talked about that. Um, we, we were trying to figure out how we should be when we go out there because we had no frame of reference. Marianne was very kind in explaining, you know, what, what, it, what there is out there, but we didn't know how we're supposed to act. Now, Carol was a preschool teacher for uh, a long period of time, probably 15, 16, 17 years or so, I think, and uh, she loved the babies. She loved the three and the four and the five years old. She used to say, if you want to know the truth, ask a four-year-old, right? <laughs> yep, ask a four-year-old. And so we talked about that a little bit, and of course our favorite gospel was the Gospel of Mark, you know, where the apostles are keeping the children from getting close to Jesus. You know, and Jesus said, you know, do not hinder them, as to just, it's to just such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. I assure you, whoever does not approach me as a little child shall not gain entry. So with that as kind of our benchmark, we said, let's go out there like we're little five-year-old kids. Don't know what we're going to run into, but we're going to be like children out there and just let happen whatever's supposed to happen. And so that's what we did. And it was the most incredible time. There was one time we were coming back from a, um, uh, a prayer service in the evening, and it had started to rain. And uh, for whatever the reason, it, well, you know, we do crazy things. So uh, we started doing the, uh, the bit from uh, Singing in the Rain. Uh, I forget what the movie is called. But, and uh, we started stomping in the puddles as we were going. And Carol was doing twirl arounds and jumping on the puddles with both feet. And then we went on the little path that took us back to the ponchin where we were staying. If there was a puddle, we wouldn't miss it. We'd hit every one of them. And I'll tell you, when we got back there, we were totally soaked and we were hysterically laughing over this freedom, this freedom to be able to just do something like that and the satisfaction that comes from just letting go, you know, and just letting yourself be like a little five-year-old child. The Blue Cross is the, uh, where the first apparitions occurred. Uh, Mary's comment is, I have come to call the world to salvation while there is still time. There is an urgency in that. You know, it's not like, okay, we've got like, you know, maybe uh, another 100 years or 200 years. Time's getting short. Uh, the world is on fire, as I said before, and uh, it's not pointed in a good direction. So Mary's messages are intended to try to steer us to where we need to be, to be able to change the world through our prayers and through our works and our actions. I've come to save the world while there's still time. The apparition site that you see there is, uh, in the nighttime, uh, it had been the place where visionaries would from time to time actually have their apparitions. There are no outdoor lights, there are no, um, no flash photography is allowed. And so I got this picture from Randy Zaleski, I don't know if Randy's here tonight or not. Oh, hi Randy. And uh, it's one of the pictures that, uh, that he was able to send to me. And it's a picture of the Blue Cross during an apparition. Now, if you look at that carefully, you see we've got some little lights here. And then we've got a whole bunch of other little circles and stuff like that there. That's not rain on the camera that took the picture. Those are what we, for want of a better word, call orbs. And what are orbs? Orbs are, I'll say it, angels, little angels. I don't note that for a fact, but that's the way that I choose to interpret it. Um, the, the gold orbs tend to be, to my understanding, a, a little higher up uh, in, in terms of hierarchy. Uh, the other orbs, the darker orbs, I don't know what those are whatsoever, but Randy with his camera was able to capture a picture of what you shouldn't be able to see, and especially 
the, the fact that you can see the people in the picture, but there's no flash allowed and there's no outdoor lights. So I'm not sure what that means. It's just signs and wonders. One of the questions that the uh, visionaries asked is why are there so many signs in Herzegovina, which is part of where uh, Croatia, or, uh, where, uh, proud of where uh, Medjugorje is part of Bosnia, Herzegovina. And Mary said it's necessary to awaken faith. It's a gift from God. Um, my daughter Jenny has uh, an interesting story that she had told in times past where she mentioned to me early on when she had uh, just uh, had her baby that uh, Haley Grace, my granddaughter, uh, had uh, little orbs in her crib and within the room and wasn't sure what that all meant. And so I went to my expert witness, Mary Ann O'Reilly, and asked her about that and she wasn't quite sure what that meant either. But we kind of pieced it together that those must be little guardians is the only thing we can figure out. And so that's kind of the, what we've, uh, we've accepted. Jenny went on to tell me that um, she was able to now distinguish between orbs that are good orbs, and there's something that happens with a bad orb, if you will, or a not so good orb, that distinguishes it separate from the good orbs. So we just assume that those are just little gifts from God to us to sustain our faith in some way, shape, or form, that there is that other world, that next world that is out there. It's not a fictional place. To get up to Mount Pradro or Apparition Hill, you have to take the dry stream bed, which is the way the water courses down when it rains like crazy out there uh, from the mountaintops. That's the water course. You'll notice the rocks are not neatly arranged, polished. There's no handles there. Um, there's no elevator service. Let's see, what else are we missing there? No, uh, no concierge you know, to kind of carry or whatever the case might happen to be. Uh, it is a rocky climb to get up there, but it's a, it's a marvelous climb also because if you allow yourself to be open, uh, it, it transforms you interiorly. You're, 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 you feel like you're almost walking in the footsteps of Jesus on his way to Calvary. You're very careful where you place your feet. You're very careful of your body movements. Nobody does anything fast. You just allow yourself to meditate as you climb up the hill. Uh, one of the things that one might find climbing up the hill are heart rocks, which we have found these last couple of times that we've gone back, uh, little hearts that are, are in the rocks. Either they're a part of a rock, or the rock is a little rock itself and it happens to be just in the shape of a heart. What does it mean? I don't know, but it's kind of nice to be able to see that. It's just, to me, it's just a little affirmation, if you will, that there's love there. There is love on that climb. Uh, there are stations of the cross as you progress up the way. Uh, and of course the idea is to awaken quickly so that you can avoid the heat and the sun. And I had an interesting experience where I was climbing up uh, Apparition Hill by myself uh, in one of the later times I'd gone out there. And as I'm climbing up, and I'm climbing up barefoot, so you really do go up differently when you're barefoot. And so I'm climbing up barefoot and I'm, I go past this this one place where there's like all these black flies. I don't know, do, they have, do black flies have nests? You know, I don't know if they do or not, but it was just like a whole nest of black flies. And so I kind of barged through that. And as I'm going through it, I just made some little side comment like, come on, Mary, can you give me a break and get rid of the flies? And I, I swear to you, uh, the next place where I came to where I had to do some more climbing, there were butterflies. Oh. Okay, Catholic coincidence, you know. Sure, maybe, I don't know. Nevertheless, when I see little of those little white butterflies flying around here, I take that as a good sign. I always look at that as kind of a good sign, kind of a reinforcement. Uh, Apparition Hill itself, uh, when you get to the top of it, it's a flat plateau basically, but as you can see, the terrain is very rocky. And the lady that's in the picture on the uh, far right side with the long hair and the little white hat on, is a lady by the name of Daniela. Daniela was part of our group, and Daniela had come down with Bell's palsy, and she had very little feeling, if any at all, in her right arm and in her right leg. And on her final climb, before it was time to go back home again, she made one last climb of Apparition Hill, and when she came down, she was in the, uh, the dining room area that we have at the Ponchin, and she said she could feel, she had feeling in her arm and she had feeling in her leg. And uh, what it means, I don't know. Maybe just God's letting her know that he appreciated the sacrifice that she was willing to make and that he cares. 
Um, this picture is a picture of where the apparition site for Mary was for uh, basically most of the time when it was on Apparition Hill. Uh, that's my pretty little lady in there, Carol Ann. And uh, it's not unusual when you get there to fall into this, this trance almost where you, you, know, you don't realize you're kneeling on rocks. You don't think of anything else other than just the feeling of a connection with Mother Mary and a connection with something very holy. Uh, we would bring petitions with us uh, when we went there. Uh, we'd ask the friends and the neighbors at the church and so forth if they wanted to have any special prayers brought to Mary. And so we'd carry those up, and then we'd go behind where the statue of Mary was and find a great big rock with a big crack in it so we could put them in and nobody was going to come and take them out and throw them in the garbage can or something like that. So we, dropped, we did that also. We dropped those off. To kneel on holy ground, how absolutely special. How absolutely special. Mount Krishavik um, is a, like I say, it's twice the size of Mount, uh, of, of, uh, Mount Prodbordo. Um, the trail is exactly the same, except the trail is twice as long up and twice as long down. Uh, I elected on the trail also to uh, do barefoot, although I was intimidated into it. Uh, there was a young lady by the name of Katie who happened to uh, decide that she was going to be running up the hill, and she did it barefoot. And then there was a, a fellow also who decided that he was going to go up barefoot. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I can't let this happen. So I took my shoes and my socks off and decided to just make the walk up. And what, a, what an interior, wonderful interior journey it is because you're humbling yourself to do something special as a sacrifice, as an offering, if you will. When I got very close to the top, um, and I was really losing steam at that point in time, that's a long way up, uh, there was a lady by the name of Lori who was part of our group. God bless you. And uh, Lori uh, was sitting on a rock and she was totally spent, had no more energy inside. She shared with me that she had basically uh, discovered just before she came out that she had cancer. And she still wanted to come because she still wanted to make the climb. It was still her goal to climb uh, Mount Krasovic. And so the interesting way that it works, there was a fellow that came along and between the two of us, we had a chance to kind of be shepherds to get her up to the cross and then eventually to shepherd her down so that she didn't have any problems or fall or anything like that. And uh, when I got up to the very, the, the, the very last station in the Stations of the Cross is right at the top of the mountain. And I'll tell you, I was never so glad to get up there. I wound up getting up there, finding a big rock to sit on, and I just sat down and it felt so good to finally be done climbing rocks because I was pretty sure that there was a grassy path that would take me over to the stairway that goes up to the cross. <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. No, it was all rocks, all the way over. <laughs> When I got up there, I actually wound up hugging the cross for about five minutes just to catch my breath. And uh, afterwards, if I can get the picture up here, whoop, wrong way, there we go. If, that's the cross, 33 feet tall. And uh, Father Parker, who's on the left, and Father Sabo was, were the two spiritual directors who came on the pilgrimage with us. Uh, they say the, the uh, pictures make you look 10 pounds heavier. Not Father Parker, not Father Sable, but the guy in the middle has got Dunlap's disease. <laughs> or the tummy Dunlap's over the pants belt, basically. But it was a very peaceful place. I can't explain anything about what's above and how that happens, but that's not all that unusual that that happens sometimes in the pictures. The ki pictures capture things that we otherwise wouldn't know. Uh, sunset at Cross Mountain uh, was very interesting. There were pictures that, uh, that are taken at sunset that kind of don't really have any explanation. And what's interesting about this picture uh, is there was a lady who had lost her daughter uh, in childbirth. Uh, the baby died, I said so the baby lived, but the mom died uh, two hours after the baby was delivered. And this was a picture that was on the cover of Spirit Daily, if you get that publication. And uh, what you can't see, or maybe you can't if you're in the front rows, there's, there's an image right up in here, and it looks like a face. It looks like a face, but it looks like the face is sideways. And that picture caught this lady's attention, and she, she was positive that that was an image of her daughter. And so she contacted Spirit Daily to find out who took the picture. It apparently took two years to be able to get the information on who it was who took the picture. And she mentioned that when she developed the picture and she blew it up so that she could look at it more clearly, she actually found 50 more faces in there. So she says, 
So what I did is I took a look at that picture, which probably, I don't know if you can see it in the back or not, but this is the image of the face here, and that's a picture of Amy, the mother. So Catholic coincidence? I don't know. But the belief is that maybe that is a picture of her daughter in another place, in some way, having come down to earth for whatever the reason. How special. St. James Church was, um, this is the church you see with the two, two bell towers there. And uh, I'd gone there, Carol went back to the room and she needed to just you know, have some downtime and just rest. It was a stressful day of walking for her. So I went to uh, St. James Church and uh, the inside of the church uh, accommodates roughly about 900 people or so. But this was later in the afternoon. It was a, uh, a prayer service for uh, saying the rosary. So he said the rosary and I came out of there probably about maybe eight minutes to six or something like that. And um, I saw Mary Ann and um, was it Gidget that was there? Gidget. And they were just kind of staring off into the distance. So I did the very sensitive thing that I always would do. I snuck up behind Mary Ann and I was going <laughs> and she didn't even look at me. She just said the sun. And I said, oh Lordy. Yeah, please God, don't let me go blind if I do this. <laughs> I remember the 60s and the hippies going blind looking at the sun. <laughs> and so I turned and I looked, and it was the most incredible thing. If you've seen it, you know what I mean. It was spinning. It was, uh, there were lightning bolts coming off of it. I can't describe it well enough. Um, there, there, it was changing colors. There was a rotation to it. And I just, you know, I was just totally caught up in the moment and grateful that I could still see after about 15 seconds or so. And uh, about that same time, the clock towers, the, the little, the big hand hit the top of the 12 and the bottom hand was down on the six. So the bells go off at six o'clock and the bells compete with each other. They, they, it's, a, it's like they challenge each other. So here I am watching the sun, the sun spinning, changing color, hearing the bells, fighting with each other, tears running down my face like you wouldn't believe, and I'm laughing like crazy. What a special moment. And that went on for about another, uh, I guess maybe about eight minutes, nine minutes, and then it, uh, it started to die away, and so I turned away again. But what an absolute gift it was to be able to have that moment. Uh, this is St. James Church in earlier times. Uh, I don't know if any of you are with the fire department here for St. Charles. If you are, I just wanted to point out that this is the fire aisle right here, and it runs right down there. So if there is a need for people to exit, there is an exit that is painted on the floor where you can leave. <laughs> Absolutely packed. Wonderful. All, the church is always packed. Always packed. They have masses every day in different languages. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Whoops, don't want to go there. Uh, let's see. Willie, have I done something wrong here? Can you move it up to return? Move it up? Let's see. No, it has stopped. Let's see. Any thoughts? Technology will always Is let you down. Escape return. Or maybe menu exit. Time out for a brief pause here. It's really not wanting to work. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yep. Funny how quickly that happens, isn't there it? Go. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, the holy water is right over there. I should probably dunk this before we go any further. Anyway, so that was St. James in earlier times. And uh, let's see, are we going to be? Able yeah, there we go. The, um, let me go back here. One more. This is just a picture that, uh, of St. James Church before there were any um, masses or anything said. I was actually vesting 
Uh, I've, I've been blessed to be able to vest and to be able to assist at Mass there. And Carol had taken the picture, and I was trying to figure out how to open the tabernacle. It's one of the few tabernacles that actually opens upward. And I must have spent five minutes trying to pry the doors this way to get it open. <laughs> so as I'm doing that, I happen to notice that I didn't, I didn't notice anything at the time. Carol didn't see anything at the time. But there's that interesting little gold thing there hanging over me, watching me very carefully for whatever it is that I'm doing there. Signs and wonders. Outside the church, the back of the church, there's a huge altar in the back. And the uh, altar is basically where they have their outdoor masses in the evening and they have adoration. Uh, the, uh, the, usually the evening is totally packed. It's a Croatian mass at six o'clock and then they have adoration following that with soft guitar music and, and different languages and it is just absolutely incredible. So beautiful. Um, we were uh, there as it got dark and as it did get dark, uh, we're listening to the music in adoration. It's probably half hour before it's going to be over. And um, the fellow, Randy, my, my buddy next to me, he, he's doing one of these kinds of things. And you know, I'm kind of looking at him and I say, Randy, what you doing? And he said, boy, he said, they're really active tonight. And I said, what's active? And he says, all those things up there. And I said, really? And he says, yeah. He says, don't you see them? And I said, no. You know, I... I can't see a thing, but God bless you, Randy, if you can see him, you know, that's fantastic. You know, that's a gift that, you know, that's just for you. So he continued to rubberneck, and we eventually wound up uh, leaving after the uh, adoration was completed. And we're walking down towards our favorite gelato stand. You, everybody has to have a favorite gelato stand. And as we're walking there, uh, Randy's out uh, in front of the church, and he's still doing kind of this thing, looking like this. And he said, you really don't see anything, do you? And I said, no. He says, they're really active. And I said, God bless you. You can see it. We can't. And uh, he said, well, would you like a picture? I said, well, yeah. <laughs> Why not? So he takes his camera, and he makes an adjustment. And he goes like that. And he comes down, and he shows us the picture. And the picture that he showed us was essentially this picture. Oops. Got to go back one. And that's the church tower bells are in the lower right-hand side. And what you, you can see some of the orbs. If you, have, if you take a closer look at the picture, there's actually a lot more little dots all over. Um, no idea what it is, no idea what it's supposed to mean, but just another one of those little signs and wonders, if you will. Very powerful. Our, the church is, uh, Catholic Church is ruling on miracles, which, of which there are miracles that appear in Medjugorje on a regular basis. The church requires full documentation for any miracles. Uh, in other words, a, a full accounting of you know, what happened preceding whatever the miracle might be if it's to be considered by the church in the church's own time, of course. Uh, testimonials of people who are aware and may have either participated in, a, in something as the miracle occurred or have information on that. Uh, any witnessing to the miracle itself occurring, support documentation that might be helpful, uh, medical and clinical information uh, that would be useful for making the determination as to what a condition is that maybe had gotten better or had been changed as a result of, um, of a miracle happening. And so I bring, that brings us to the Mark Kedzie story, if you will. Um, if, if, there's no little ones here today, are there? Okay, I was going to say if they're afraid of the picture or something, those are just doctors, x-rays. Um, Mark Kedzie uh, experienced something very, very unusual in Medjugorje that uh, changed his life forever. What I'd like to do is, is there someone here, is there a mom who could come up and actually read just the little bit about the story of Mark Kedzie for me? I need somebody who's a mom. Any moms? Come on. <laughs> Sarah, thank you. I think there's like four pages. Okay. 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 Yeah. When I was pregnant with my fourth son, Mark, I found out that my baby in utero had a lot of deformities. The neonatal specialist didn't know if we would want to save him. Of course, we did. We got a lot of people and prayer communities praying for him. When Mark was born, a healthy, beautiful baby, we thought that was the miracle. But Mark's life became a series of one health problem after another, 
He was always sick and had two surgeries and more medical treatments than I care to remember by the time he was two years old. He also had severe developmental delays. When Mark was nearly four, we discovered the cause of many of his problems. One deformity had remained. X-rays revealed that the top four vertebrae in his neck were malformed and compressed, with his head pressing down on his spinal cord. This explained why, after almost two years of speech, developmental, occupational, and physical therapies, he still could not talk. He could grunt out vowel sounds, but he could not say any consonant sounds. He couldn't even hum. He walked, but he had trouble navigating his way around obstacles or along the path, and he dragged his right side. He tired very easily. He was highly sensitive to various textures. He couldn't run, jump, or climb, or even crawl. It was in an optimal condition, and as he grew, the increasing pressure would continue to cause additional problems as his head short-circuited his nervous system until it shortened his life. Then, on the Feast of the Assumption in 2001, I felt the strongest message in my heart that I should take Mark to Medjugorje to be healed. I knew Medjugorje was a place in Bosnia where the Blessed Mother had reportedly been appearing to missionaries since 1981, and I always believed it. But I didn't want to leave my family, take my little special needs boy by myself and go there. We couldn't afford it for one thing. There were too many activities with my other boys to work out for another. And how could I get around my story with Mark? I would have to carry him or push him in a stroller, which I would have to carry onto the airplanes. And all I knew about going there was that you climbed mountains, listened to people give talks, and prayed a lot of rosaries. Other than the rosaries, I didn't know how that would be with my challenged almost four-year-old. I asked a couple of my friends from my Curcio group to pray for my discernment. I even knew someone from Curcio who led groups there. Once I decided that I was being called to go and said yes to God, I received an unexpected check in the mail from my father-in-law, who knew nothing about the trip. The check was for the exact amount I needed for Mark and I to go. My mother had died earlier, and my dad's message was, this is from mom. My friends continued to pray and to fast or abstain from something twice a week for Mark's healing. They also helped work out the details of caring for my three other boys, who were also praying and fasting for their little brother. In Medjugorje, God provided all I needed, including men to carry Mark up across the mountain, across the vineyards, and wherever I really needed help with him. I even got to bring him for a private meeting with one of the visionaries, Vita, who prayed over Mark, recommending him to the Blessed Mother. Near the end of the trip, during Mass, when everyone stood to sing the Alleluia, Mark sang the alphabet song. For me, it was as miraculous, miraculous as if a blind man could suddenly see. And when we left the church, he jumped for the first time. And when we went up Apparition Hill, Mark climbed it without needing to be carried. I knew healing had occurred. When we got home, new x-rays showed Mark's now perfectly formed vertebrae and his head resting where it should be above them. Thank you so much.
I'm so proud of Tom and Lori Kedzie also for their love for their child. Mark is now 18, and I think he is on track to be a, he's being prepared to be a youth minister, is he not? Or youth leader, youth group leader. How absolutely powerful. What a story, what a powerful story. The message to the world from last month that we had, the, there's a, a monthly message that we received from Medjugorje, was Mary basically saying, I'm looking at you and I see you lost. You do not have prayer or joy in your hearts. Put God in the first place. Don't lose hope. Pray fast and penance. This is the love of Medjugorje. And as we begin to conclude, I'd like to ask Mary Ann, could you come up and could you read the message for August 25th, if you will, that had just been printed? Today's message today, 25th of August, 2016. Dear children, today I desire to share heavenly joy with you. You little children, open the door of your heart so that hope, peace, and love, which only God gives, may grow in your hearts. Little children, you are too bound to the earth and earthly things. That is why Satan is ruling you like the wind which blows the waves of the sea. Therefore, may the chain of your life be prayer with the heart and adoration of my son Jesus. Give over your future to him so that in him you may <coughs> be joy and an example with your lives to others. Thank you for having responded to my call. He loves in the past few months has been saying that we must pray for our shepherds. So please pray for our shepherds for now, right? Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. The word peace translates into mirror in Croatian. And so if you'd like more information on Medjugorje, if you go to Medjugorje, mirror, 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 M I R, M I R, M I R. That's one site you can go to. Spirit Daily is also another place that you could go to also to collect information or find information on Medjugorje. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the gift of your presence here this evening. I hope you found it heartening to be able to hear Mary's messages. And may God bless you abundantly for the good works that you do in your lives. <laughs> And now for those of you who have been to Medjugorje before, a special treat, if I may.